So let's start in on the D on the D part. Um, one of the things that I found fascinating, just because I'm also very interested in health and wellness for, for people, was just the shift in um, uh, modern day industrial agriculture and how that has impacted the dog food industry and what's going on there. And I was just hoping you guys might touch on that as it relates to diet and nutrition um, and the importance of what we need to know. Uh, I want to give you the floor for that. Well, I'll start and you can summarize. Sure. Obviously, um, genetically modified foods and big agriculture, uh, glyphosate has made food significantly cheaper and readily available to many more people. Not everyone. We still have a worldwide starvation issue, but generally- Dr. Speaking, Becker, can you define glyphosate for people who may not? Yeah. So glyphosate is Roundup, and we have been able to, to create- herbicides, pesticides that work with genetically modified crops to be able to increase the yield, which means we can produce much more food at a cheaper price faster because of modern technology that involves using chemicals on our food and chemicals in our on our plants and in our animals to help them grow faster and produce bigger yields. We can get more food using modern technology that involves chemical use. Those chemicals have come with a side effect, not only disrupting the soil microbiome, disrupting the plant's microbiome, disrupting animals' microbiomes, but it also disrupts the microbiomes. Glyphosate disrupts your dog's microbiome. Mm. And that's just the, the trade-off, the side effect of mass agriculture. The side effect of everything that's not used in the human food industry goes into pet food. And pet food is feed grade foodstuffs blended together that has a vitamin and mineral supplement added to meet minimum nutritional requirements and that's the definition of modern day pet food and pet food has been around you know 100 years a little over 100 years and out of that we have had tremendous convenience we're able to nourish our pets very cheaply and inexpensively to sustain life but if you're a longevity junkie sustaining life we're thankful we can sustain life there's a whole lot more to living than existing and what we know is that a diet of ultra processed foods from birth till death may not be the formula for vibrant health, disease mediation, and life extension, that the body probably needs more than ultra processed food to maintain vibrant health. So you, you wanna talk a little bit about um, the microbiologists maybe uh, that we talked to and the fact that when we asked them uh, ultra processed foods forever, what their, what their take home yeah, was. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was really important when we were breaking this down to try to meet everybody's needs. Because of course, you know, we've mentioned this before in the United States, um, the budget isn't as big for pet food as it is in like other countries. As an example here in Canada, according to research, the average Canadian spends close to about $100 a month on dog food. That gives you a pretty big range of different types of foods that you could bring into your house that may improve uh, your, your dog's lifespan and health span. However, sadly, in the United States, the average spend on dog food is $23, Gila. Mm. That's not a lot of wow. money. So wow. that doesn't really give you a lot of range. Like you can go into you know one of your big box stores and you can buy a 20 pound bag of food for $11. You can't do that in a lot of countries. And so when we were writing this book, we were like, well, how do we talk to everybody? Because if the majority of the people in the world can only spend $23, how do we talk to those people? It's going to be very hard pressed for us to say, go out, buy organic foods that you're most likely not buying at home for you and for yourself, yourself and your children, yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. And then us turn around and tell you to do organic and free range and chop this and chop that. Like, we're only talking to a small sub sub subset of people. Even the publishers, when we were talking to publishers, the there, well, we're a little worried here because as a public, not, not only as a publisher, but as a pet parent, I don't have the time to do all of this. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have the time, I also don't have the resources. So one of the things that was really important when we were designing the diet section was we know when we talk to microbiologists like Dr. Tim Spector, one of the most cited scientists in the world for microbiology and the gut biome, he'll tell you, as well, hundreds of more microbiologists, that the more diverse your gut biome is, the better you are health-wise and the better opportunity you have to live to be a centenarian, a long time, over 100. In fact, when they started to analyze people's GI systems, the American Gut Project, which I believe is the largest citizen science microbiome project from the United States, they found that just for humans to have that sort of diversity for their gut biome, you need to be eating about 30 different vegetables a week. 
And who does that? I mean, well, here in my hometown yeah. of Nova Scotia, we live way up north here in Canada. In my grocery store, I'm lucky to find 10 different vegetables, yeah. let alone eat 30 different vegetables a week. So it was important that we said, all right, how can we how can we bring this sort of diversity into this bowl trying to meet food, you know, food budgeting? So it was very important to us. We looked at the spectrum of people that had all the money in the world and we said, okay, let's break down the diet by what you can do as far as processing techniques go when you're out, when you go into a pet retail specialty where you should be shopping and you're going to support that local independent. When you're looking through the categories of foods that they have, forget brands for a second, brands are important, but categories of food. Mm -hmm raw food diets, freeze-dried diets, dehydrated, air-dried, canned, semi-moist, kibble. I don't know, there's probably way yeah. more than just those. But when you're going through that category of food, what are you actually looking at, A? Which one is the best one that can help build your dog's microbiome? If you only have a dollar, where can you spend your money to help build your dog's microbiome? And so on and so forth. So that was a really big category there. The other section of the diet were those people that, let's say, really had a hard time making ends meet. We know that right now we're going through a pandemic. We know that times are rough for a lot of people. So what type of hacks do we have if you had no money? What are some free hacks that you could do to help increase your dog's, let's say, um, strengthen your dog's GI system, which will then strengthen their immune system and help with overall health? And so we started to tailor and break things down and section them off in the book that way. And it's interesting because even the owners of the oldest dogs in the world, all of these dogs ate more than kibble. But at some point, all of these owners offered a little bit of kibble out. You know, did you want to eat it? Did you not? Most of these dogs did not consume a lot of ultra processed foods. They ate either mom and dad cooked for them part time. They ate a lot of leftovers. Now, when we say leftovers, we mean healthy leftovers. They were not eating pizza crust. You know, they were eating. They were eating when. Although that's delicious. Although it is delicious. It's not, <laughs> the dogs don't have a carb requirement. Yeah. <laughs> when mom and dad were peeling carrots or chopping the ends off the carrots or snapping pea ends, they, they were fed to the dogs. It's recycling fresh vegetable scraps to mm. dogs. It's recycling last night's leftover meat to the dogs. It's sharing freshly prepared human grade food, meats and veggies specifically with dogs. And every single ancient dog owner that we interviewed did that. And they did it for a lifetime. So it's not that ultra processed food has to stop. It's that if you can afford to feed less processed food, so kibble has been high heat processed four times. And then, you know, as you go down to minimally processed food, obviously raw food hasn't been processed at all. Gently cooked food at home has only been minimally heat processed once. Freeze dried food has only been frozen. So there are food choices that capture the nutrient load in a healthier fashion to be passed up the food chain if you apply less heat. So premise number one, if you can afford to pick food besides high heat processed foods, do it. If you can't, then what that means is when you open your fridge or when you're making a salad or when you find that dented blueberry that you don't really want to eat, those dogs benefit from fresh leftovers coming from your fridge more so than dogs fed an all raw diet because dogs getting all raw foods already have those unheat processed nutrients being passed up the food chain. So in essence, it's a little bit like feeding our kids or feeding our bodies. If we primarily eat a lot of ultra processed, highly refined junk food or fast food, we should be doing something intentionally throughout the day to balance the load of that ultra processed food. And the same is true of dogs. And we focused very heavily just to touch off of that on, of course, balancing variation and moderation, because even people with the most beautiful intentions in the world sometimes are just wired sometimes just to be like, you know, I've met people that will say, hey, I want to make fresh food at home and they feed their dog, let's say like ground beef and carrots for the next eight years of that dog's life. So there is that. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. So there is that subcategory of people that, you know, are there. So, you know, we what we, we really wanted to stress in this, you know, we want people to be able to do it in a well-educated manner yeah. with some science backing it up um, and to help guide them to, you know, do heal and not harm. Yeah, and um, and I really appreciate that you're bringing up the point that um, it's not an all or nothing, and mm. that, that every step of the way we have the power to, uh, based on what we're capable of, our our means, our knowledge, or what's available to us, that we can make these um, little baby steps to to make those changes. And and every every shift is is good when there's that awareness. I was just curious, you, you know, it is so confusing. For the consumer, um, dog is good. We go to all the 
pet industry trade shows. And as we walk the floors of those um, various shows, it's like, how do, how do people, how do these buyers discern what's, what they're going to be bringing into their stores? And then how do the, how does the consumer decide, you know, which is processed? I know in the book, you, there's a section there where you kind of take people through um, how they can identify, you know, if I'm going to pick this kind of food, well, what would be the, the best one? And we don't need to talk brands, but I mean, what, you know, what should we be looking for? Yeah. So there is, you're absolutely right. There's good, better, best brands within every food choice. But part of the reason that we really wanted to educate readers on how to choose foods objectively is that brands change, Gila. Brands sell, you know, foods that start out as mom and pop end up being purchased by Mars and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you're committed to a brand, you are more committed to potentially not necessarily being aware of what you need to be looking for. So first we think about what's biologically appropriate. When we walk you through the process of doing what we call pet food homework, we think about where are the nutrients coming from. So it, and there again, that just comes down to your personal food philosophy. And we walk you through how to figure out if you've never thought about what matters to you for food or how to nourish your body, or your family's body. We walk you through that first because your personal, your personal food philosophy, philosophy matters when it comes to what you're going to feed. So first you figure out what do you believe in what's important to you? Is it economics only? Is it based on where, you know, what, what's important to you? After you know what's important to you, it's easier to align with a brand and a company that's providing that. So figuring out what you want from food matters first. Once you figure that out, then it's where do the nutrients come from? So they either come from a synthetic multivitamin or from real whole foods, two different categories, and you can, you can figure out brands within that. Then we have you do the carb equation and you figure out how much sugar's in the food because sugar plays into a lot of longevity conversations we had with all of the longevity experts that we spoke with. So calculating what's not on the label, including how much sugar is in your dog food is a really important step. We also then walk you through how to discern how much refinement has each of those ingredients undergone because as the foods are refined, quality and refinement play into ultimately how much metabolic burden your dog's body is under. So we walk you through this pet food homework steps so that you can objectively not be committed to a brand, but be committed to the, the type of food that you know that you are feeding because that's what you are intentionally choosing versus falling for marketing claims or brand claims, which really can be quite deceptive and heartbreaking. We can't tell you the number of people that once they did pet food homework, they think, oh my gosh, what I thought I was feeding is not what I was feeding. And so just learning about what is really in your dog food is a really important step. And not just to, you know, what to look for when you're looking for something, let's say for health benefits, but to what to watch out for yeah. that could be potentially harming. I mean, just recently we posted about titanium dioxide and literally almost broke the internet with the post. Titanium dioxide is no mystery to a lot of people. It's used as an additive in a lot of pet food to whiten pet food. For years, it has been one of those controversial additives that have, has been going back and forth. Well, if we don't use a lot of it, maybe it's not that it's big of a deal. We know, amounts. yeah, because I mean, they yeah, use that, it in paint. It's just, it just the sound of it. Paint. The sound of it doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> it's, it's got, it got so scary, Gila, that the European Union had to step in, the food safety authorities over there, and they banned it from all food now in Europe. It's actually in confectionery goods, believe it or not, like Skittles and things like that that kids can US buy. Still, yeah. In the uh. U.S. still. Now, they've, banned, they've just recently banned it from, in Europe, and they, they're just like, this is no longer safe. They've done studies. They find that, my gosh, that this stuff can actually like mutate DNA. Like that's how terrible wow. this stuff is. And they, where do we you, find this? I mean, like, what is? Well, why are they it's using like eighty percent of pet food? It's in a lot of. Pe <laughs> it's in the number one treat in the United States now. Not in all of their yeah. lines, but it's in a couple of their brands. So, like, it's in a couple of their products. So, when you have a brand, you know, they have a wide range of products. So, we started posting. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, yeah. but I'm just curious. Like, why is it in there? What is their? What is the? It's a whitener. It's a whitener. It's a whitener. You see, if you ever made, if you ever, if you, if you ever stood beside a pet food machine, let's just say and watched it spit out some canned food into a can or even kibble you would freak out when you saw the color come out right like you literally it comes out like a grayish it, it, it it's not it's a horrible horrible looking. color when it comes in so in the olden days they would just take food coloring like let's say red dye number 40 which i know here in canada is a mm -hmm. no carcinogen but still used in places around the world and then they would put red on top of it trying to mute the gray so it doesn't you don't get that 
fresh, meaty look, unfortunately. But now turn it around and whiten it first, just like painting your walls. If you've got a color there and you don't put down a white primer before you color, it, it can be challenging to get the color that you want. So you've got to like, let's say, prime it, if you may. Hit it up with some titanium dioxide, whiten it, then turn it around and color it, and now you've got the colors that you want. Let me tell you, when we started to tell Americans and people all around the world about this, brought it to light, even though the study came out in the spring and no one paid attention to it, it not only did it break the internet, but you started to see people all over the globe flashing their product, their ingredient labels. So you asked what's in it. They were flashing doggy toothpaste. They were flashing supplements. They were flashing top selling tweets. Vet, like raw hides, food. Right, all right, the, the reason raw hides are not nasty brown and they're white is that they've been bleached with or whitened with titanium dioxide. So like prescription I, diets prescription that you can foods, buy at vet clinics. Prescription foods for animals that are unwell, a lot of titanium dioxide. So it's a little bit shocking. So you'll find titanium dioxide in the dirty dozen list, I think is where you were going with That's that. That's exactly where I was going with it. Sorry, sometimes I go on these tangents with these ingredients. But that being said, you know, if you are worried about some of these things that are in the market that you have no idea, at least we can arm you with awareness. Some people don't like awareness and sometimes it can challenge belief systems, but hey man, the science is there and the research is there. So I, I would want the heads up as a pet parent. So I believe all 2.0 pet parents want to be like, give me the information and at least I know it. So when I'm out there, when I know better, I can only do better. So that whole yeah. diet section, Gila, was really about educating pet parents on how to make better choice, looking at evaluating the food that they're currently feeding. Then they have the information that they need to, put to if they want to improve the diet, if they're like, okay, I can see now why I don't want to be keep feeding this. It also gives them the information to make better choices so they can go to the pet store and they apply those same educational principles on what foods they want to improve to. And then we walk them through them steps as to how to transition from maybe a, a poor diet to an average diet, to a good diet, to a better diet, to the best diet within that category. Yeah. Once you've maxed out at the best diet in that category, you can then hop food categories to ultimately get to the best food you can feed your dog with the resources you have. And once you get there, then there's still things you can do to continually top off. We talk about core longevity toppers and adding key superfoods that supercharge your dog's body based on what specific issues are going on in your dog's body. So it's this constant learning process that really is the definition of a longevity junkie. It's your commitment, it's your promise to your dog that you will continue making daily lifestyle choices for the emotional and physical benefit of your dog and you will not stop learning and applying what you've learned until the day your dog transitions that's your job as a longevity junkie and that is the definition of a forever dog is you have promised your dog you will not stop working on their well-being i am so moved by uh everything both of you just said but most especially this last statement um, so poignant. First off, I love the longevity junkie aspect. And, and you're right, it is a promise to your dog. Uh, not an unintentional moment for a plug, but a uh, dog is good. One of our most, uh, our newest design is entitled Promise to My Dog. And it is, you know, kind of uh, not in as in different words, but with the, with the emphasis on the same thing. And until the day they uh, have Forever. to cross the Forever. forever yeah yeah it's yes. forever yeah so uh i i love that that you just mentioned that um okay obviously i could we could go on talk forever on the <laughs> yes. i want to close this one section just by saying first off thank you because um this gives even those who think they already know a lot a reminder and i love that you shared this early on um the unconscious incompetent where we just don't know what we don't know enough even to ask the right questions. So you guys, this element uh, really brings together all the pieces in it and it simplifies it and it's just incredible.